Welcome everybody, I'm Professor Azrini Wahidin. Good afternoon and good evening to our international participants. I'd like to begin by thanking you all for joining us. Uh, for, 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 thank, you for all, thank you all for joining myself and Professor John Brewer and some of the contributors um, for the launch of our co-edited book, Ex-Combatants, Voices and um, Transitioning from War to Peace in Northern Ireland, South Africa and Sri Lanka. I will put a link to the book um, a bit later on, but here's the, a picture of it in our hands. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Warwick Interdisciplinary Research Centre for International De Development, Dr Monihan for co-organising this event and to Pal Gray for providing a discount. If anyone wishes to buy the book, the link, the promo code is in the chat. Today's session will begin by contextualising the edited collection and then I will pass the floor to our esteemed speaker, Professor John Brewer who will speak for 45 minutes and there will be time for questions and comments at the end. Professor John Brewer requires no introduction. His work speaks for itself. It is therefore a great privilege to welcome John to Warwick. His list of awards, positions of esteem and publications are numerous, but I do have, however want to acknowledge a selection of his publications and his contribution to the discipline. He's a professor of post-conflict studies in the Senator George J. Mitchell Institute for Global Peace, Security and Justice. He's an honorary professor extraordinary at Stellenbosch University. He has been president of the British Sociological Association from 2009 to 2012, and is now an honorary life of vice president and has also been a member of the Governing Council of the Irish Research Council and of the Council of the Academy of Social Sciences. In 2010, he was appointed to the United Nations roster of global experts for his expertise in, in peace processes. He is the author or co-author of 16 books and editor or co-author of further six. He is the editor of the exciting book series, Power Grave Studies and Compromise After Conflict, and co-editor of the Bristol University Press series, Public Sociology. He's currently writing a commission book for Edward Elgar Publications, an advanced introduction to the social, sociology of peace processes. So without further ado, I'd like to begin by providing an overview of the book, Ex-Combatants Voices, Transitioning from War to Peace, in Northern Ireland, South Africa and Sri Lanka. The book emerged from several inspirational discussions with John, who is the series editor for Power Grey Studies in Compromise After Conflict, and, my, and from my own work on women in the IRA and the ANC. The ambition of the book is to provide a broader critical understanding of the post-conflict paradigm by examining the experiences of former ex-combatants in, in the process of peace building. This volume situates three societies that operate within the context of empire, the struggle against colonization and the material struggle against social injustice and inequality. What is truly unique about this volume is the range of authors and the countries of conflict, Northern Ireland, South Africa and Sri Lanka. It's divided into three parts. Part one focuses on voices from Northern Ireland and Britain. Part two, Voices from South Africa, with one case study focusing on girl soldiers returning from a rebel group in northern Uganda, and part three, Voices from Sri Lanka. This volume throws light on the motivations for engagement in military struggle. It focuses on the lived experiences of women, men, child soldiers, and state veterans in the belief that they each have different experiences in the transition to peace. A number of common themes emerge, the nature of their respective demobilization, demilitarization and reintegration programs, the effect of, of ongoing material inequalities faced by ex-combatants as a legacy of colonialism, the impact of masculinity and gender differences on the lived experiences of ex-combatants now and in the past, 
the contested victim status of state veterans, the varying levels of engagement with the peace process and techniques of neutralization used to give meaning to their actions and the moral claims to victimhood status. The volume rightly addresses the invisibilization, the exclusion, the silences, and the erasure of certain categories of combatants through their physical and discursive disappearance from DDR policies and practices. The purpose of this book is to hear the voices of a range of combatants and the vital role they played in the process of post-conflict social reconstruction, recovery, and reconciliation. Thus, this volume is designed to, one, capture directly the voices of different kinds of combatants in their own words, provide the voices of those from below, the rank and file, rather than political leaders. Thirdly, provide insight into the transition issues facing former ex-combatants across the life course. Fourthly, highlight the cultural, societal and emotional issues in the transition from war to peace as they affect ex-combatants. Explore the various contributions former combatants have made to post-conflict compromise, reconciliation and peace building. Locate in a single framework the contrasting <coughs> transition experiences of state veterans and other forms of ex-combatants. Finally, isolate the gendered and post-colonial legacies of war warfare as they continue to impinge on the lives of some ex-combatants. We bring together in this edited collection practitioners, early career researchers, established academics, drawing on empirical research to examine the experiences of former combatants from a global north, global south perspective. The incorporation of a post-colonial lens allows for the concept of the south not to be not only to be understood in terms of geography, but also as a metaphor that acknowledges the global inequality in the access to financial, financial aid, knowledge and power. The, the contributors in this book brings together critical understandings of different dimensions to the legacy of war by acknowledging the shadow of colonialism. Obviously, the regime of colonialism as the accumulation of dispossession, which has left its imprint in the regimes of dependency and divisions between core and periphery that continue to play out in global markets of production and exchange. By reorientating and refocusing the experiences of former ex-combatants outside the metropolitan north, we seek to develop new ways of understanding the motivations and experiences of former combatants so that the South is understood on its own terms. This is part of a larger project, project that by incorporating a global South perspective in the social sciences, we will be contributing to a more nuanced understanding of the legacy of war, the context and contours of state violence, state impunity, violence, sustainable peace, victimhood, the absent present of victims in post-conflict societies, the role of victimhood in the move towards re reconciliation, cognitive justice, and ultimately peace building. These chapters draw on the relationship between the cultural, physical, psychological, and structural violence left by a history of colonialism, relig religious and ethnic wars. The book is of importance in its questioning of what is identified as the martyr hero demon syndrome coined by Brewer. The moral judgment work claimed surrounding this framework morally takes into account the level and depth of military involvement and provides the, the space to question our responses to them. Martyrdom in many ways resides in the death of the individual and in the death, the past speaks to the present and the future. The martyr straight hero dichotomy is also heavily gendered. The purpose of constructing the other only serves to prevent seeing the human in the story. A true measure of reconciliation is when we step away from the rigid moral framework that, de that degenerates, that denigrates all hero worships. In this vein, 
it's necessary to hear and understand the moral claims that ex-combatants give voice and meaning to. Today's paper will tease out techniques of neutralisation, the moral claims that are used to give understanding and meaning to the process of creating a reconciling presence. These included the, these issues include their motivations for participating in the military struggle, their lived experiences in transitioning from war to peace, their emotional legacies, if any, of their former involvement in conflict, other social reintegration issues back into civilian status, whether that be material, economic, social, cultural, etc. Their techniques of neutralisation in their accounts of their involvement as they look back and then moral claims they'll make to victimhood status. Now, the engagement of not with reconciliation and peace today, and their feelings towards the peace process, in their case, country, in their case, countries such as the enduring legacy of colonialism, trauma, and an ambivalence towards the settlement provides a distinctive focus. It is in the unearthing of the moral and political claims of military involvement that the utility of the martyr hero demon syndrome is challenged. It is important, therefore, to isolate the different transitioning experiences of the varying kinds of state veterans and non-state veterans to illuminate how moral claims become processed through which enable a degree of self-reflection, the articulation of competing moral and political frameworks through which they are perceived. By drawing on research from Northern Ireland, South Africa and Sri Lanka, this edited volume brings together in a compelling and unique way, we would argue, an interrogation of the martyr hero demon continuum, to, which, gain, which will provide a greater understanding of the difficult societal and redemptive challenges combatants face on their journey to peace. The chapters illustrate that ex-combatants embody multiple subject positions that are sites of moral contestations, that are fluid and require careful social navigation. A recurrent theme throughout the chapters is the importance of the way in which combatants and victims of war are understood and come to understand themselves in the process of creating an environment for sustainable peace to flourish. This process brings light to the importance of truth telling in capturing the wider story of traumatic pasts and that of reconciliation to support the process of compromise after conflict. This book takes, takes inspiration from previous attempts to decenter and decolonize the social science of by drawing on different disciplines to produce a multidisciplinary text. Brewing 2010 averts that the sorts of concepts that this edited volume has brought together, such as truth, memory, masculinity, hope, forgiveness, reconciliation, restorative justice, victims, gender, circulate around and across disciplinary boundaries. They are given intellectual refreshments when they travel through unfamiliar disciplines. We hope you agree that this book achieves its ambition of expanding the sociological imagination by critically engaging in the repertoire of experiences of former combatants, by bridging the divide between the global north and global south. We hope that the fascination of social, sociology lies in the fact that its perspective makes us see in, in a new light the very world in which we have to live our lives. It is by creating new understandings that we wish to bring to the fore the experiences and motivations of former combatants across the life course and gender spectrum as we move towards sustainable peace and reconciliation. The process of reintegration of ex-combatants at the end of, of an armed conflict is a complex pro process which not only aims to transform narratives of violence into narratives of peace, but also transforms the destructive function of war into constructive social and political change. This change is often characterized by a process of creating enabling social, economic and political conditions 
in which ex-combatants are able to, to transform their identity into a new identity of civilian. The capacities to integrate back into society, both socially and economically, largely depend on their ability to adapt and forge new social networks and create new social capital. This volume illustrates that ex-combatants do not constitute a homogenous social category, rather they form a heterogeneous social entity, with individual ex-combatants having different needs, interests and aspirations in the peace process. It argues that in such a complex environment of war to, to peace transition, not all ex-combatants reintegrate into society in the, main, in the same manner or at the same rate. As one turns the pages of this book, we hope that you share our utopic vision that in transitioning to peace, we can learn from the mistakes of the past and move towards reconciliation underpinned by commitment to create a socially just world. This process becomes a program of possibilities, a rebirth whilst exposing the interconnected sinews of violence and inequality within the social order of the past. We would argue that the opportunities that the cessation of conflict brings with, within its reach is hope. It is a hope, a belief, a faith that calls for change in the social order that will benefit all members of society. Giroud stated that hope is the precondition for an individual and social, structure, social struggle. Hope proffers something better, even if this has yet to be fully realised. We are all part of reimagining a shared and better future. Thank you. I will now give, give John the floor to talk to his paper, Ex-Combatants, Claims to Moral Legitimacy. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Azrini. Uh, I'm privileged to share with you the launch of our new co-edited collection. And it's very pleasant to be, if only virtually, in the university of my late friend and mentor, John Rex. Uh, what I'm going to do is to address some themes from the book as a taster. Along with victims, ex-combatants constitute one of the most important stakeholders in a peace process. And having written in uh, 2018, two books on victims in Northern Ireland, Sri Lanka and South Africa. <coughs> uh, Azrini and I felt it very important uh, to reflect the voice of this other stakeholder in a peace process. The moral contestation around the category ex-combatant, however, means that they are rarely approached dispassionately. And it's this moral contestation that I wish to focus upon tonight, rather than legal or political considerations. And my lecture addresses what the book calls the martyr hero demon syndrome and suggests that this syndrome is a distorting moral framework with which to engage ex-combatants who are transitioning to peace. Now we all know that the victims literature emphasizes the idea of competitive victimhood which imposes a victim hierarchy with one's own group victims at the apex as the most heinously treated and the most innocent. Well, the martyr hero demon syndrome is, it, is its equivalent for ex-combatants. Ex-combatants can be lionized or demonized in equal measure. <clears throat> now this dualistic oppositional characterization of ex-combatants occurs independently of the outcome of the war. And it is explained by the continuance of competing moral frameworks that survive into the peace. Uh, peace processes that are settled with a compromise deal do not necessarily 
change people's private personal feelings towards combatants, even if in the public sphere they practice tolerance. And the point I wish to argue this evening is that the martyr hero demon syndrome that venerates or denigrates ex-combatants in equal measure misrepresents them. It misrepresents them through vain, glorious attempts to put them on the side of the angels or the devil. And it is very selective in the ex-combatants whose voice is heard in the process. <clears throat> now, severe moral judgments about ex-combatants, which turn them into martyrs, heroes or demons, are affected by three factors. First, the repressive nature of the regime which can legitimize resistance against it. Secondly, the moral virtues embedded in cultural norms in the global north that offer excuses and mediating factors. And thirdly, by the moral claims that ex-combatants themselves make. Colonial, authoritarian and autocratic regimes tend to resolve most of the moral ambiguities that affect ex-combatants when there is regime change, affording them the status of freedom fighters. In these instances, the moral dilemma is posed for state veterans rather than resistance fighters. State veterans who fought in support of Nazism, the Latin American dictatorships, or apartheid, for example, are severely judged morally after regime change, leaving um, freedom fighters to recoup moral legitimacy. Now, a further complication that clouds simplistic moral judgments of ex-combatants is the excuses and, mitigation, and mitigations that are inherent in cultural norms in the global north. Women ex-combatants and child soldiers carry moral virtues in the global north because of western conceptions of gender and childhood that contain inbuilt excuses and mitigations. Women and children, the argument goes, must have inevitably been functioning under duress. We therefore hear, for example, about the Tamil Tigers forcing women and children to be fighters in Sri Lanka's war, with little ability to resist, as if the intent to want to fight is inconceivable because it is contrary to how cultural norms in the global north perceive womanhood and childhood. So gender and age related excuses. They were young, they were raped, they were drugged, constitute the moral framework that mitigates severe moral judgments in the global north about these categories of ex-combatant. By corollary, the severest moral judgments are reserved for adult males who supposedly carry the moral agency to have understood what they were doing. And the, the final source of moral confusion concerns the moral claims that ex-combatants themselves make. Ex-combatants stake their own claim to moral virtue. And it is these claims that I wish to address in my lecture this evening. Uh, before doing so, however, there is a prior question left begging here. Does the use of violence in the military struggle deny any claim to moral virtue? 
because killing for peace and justice seems not to make sense. Now, what is referred to in the literature as virtuous violence means that violence is sometimes necessary and instrumental. As Sir Adam Roberts reminded us, therefore, with virtual violence, justice can sometimes conflict with peace. And the claim to non-violence should not always take precedence, especially when all other non-violent avenues have been exhausted or have failed. And violence aimed at ending massive human rights violations falls into this category. Indeed, it could be argued that it is unjust not to try to intervene to protect human rights. Or as the US poet Wheeler, Ella, Ella Wheeler Wilcox once put it, it is sinful to be silent. However, the different moral frameworks through which people approach the virtuousness of political violence as a result of the martyr hero uh, demon syndrome mean that people mostly object to the violence used against them, never to their own. Now, the moral standard which judges the, the virtuousness of one's own violent acts against the moral wickedness of opponents' violence is actually amoral. The martyr hero demon syndrome fails to recognize that most political violence is morally bound and conducted under moral frameworks, not just the violence we support. But those whose violence we oppose are alleged to conduct their violence without rules and moral limits. Our own is supposedly always rule bound and morally justified. Now, Martha uh, Nussbaum, a uh, moral and legal philosopher whom I deeply respect, once intervened in this debate. She argued that a norm of reasonableness mediates people's emotional response to violence. Anger, protest, violence, which are thought reasonable, is responded to more positively than when thought unreasonable. However, this normally results in people being incapable of seeing the reasonableness of their opponent's violence, only their own. Now, this moral backcloth makes it necessary, I suggest, to investigate the moral claims to legitimacy that ex-combatants themselves make. Before I do that, we need to address two prior issues it, uh, that help us move beyond the martyr hero demon syndrome. The first issue is anger. The second issue is punishment. Let me come to anger. Everyone gets angry, but not everyone resorts to violence because of it. Anger can have moral legitimacy. Not all types of anger are dysfunctional in peace processes. Indeed, my new book on the sociology of peace processes develops a sociology of anger. But being angry is not enough legitimation <clears throat> for political violence. So most ex-combatants, when giving accounts of their recourse to violence, therefore felt under a moral impulse to explain the reasonableness of their anger. Now, if it is necessary 
to dissuade ourselves of the perception that ex-combatants are just angry people. It is equally important to be dissuaded of the view that they have not been punished. Con conditions of amnesty, of license, of early release only apply after they have served time in prison. Those that have never been in prison have not had their guilt proven and do not deserve punishment. The idea thus is that such culprits were just lucky enough not to get caught. They deserve punishment anyway. Now, punishing those not even charged, let alone found guilty, attests to the real issue behind the concern with punishment. It is that ex combatants have not been punished enough. What is enough punishment? This is a moral question, not a legal one. If the purpose of punishment is to inflict the kind and degree of suffering that the wrongdoer deserves, could we ever publish them enough? No human punishment seems enough, seems enough to those who want retribution. What punishment is it that ex-combatants deserve? Now, the answers to these, to these moral questions tend to be resolved by applying the competing and relative moral frameworks within the martyr hero demon syndrome. There can never be enough punishment for perpetrators of the violence we oppose. While no punishment is necessary for the perpetrators of the violence we support. Now, it is this moral confusion that makes the, the prosecution of British soldiers in Northern Ireland, for example, so hotly contested. So, with these caveats, let me come to the moral claims that ex combatants themselves make. As, as Rini has already alluded, these claims function as techniques of neutralization, as the old sociology of deviance literature put it. They are different from excuses and justifications. Excuses and justifications entail admission of wrongdoing and the recognition of the need to take blame. Moral claims, however, transcend culpability. Moral claims make the choice to fight a rational means end decision, avoiding having to accept their actions as wrong and in need of excuse. So their moral claims instead frame their actions as reasonable. Now, in research undertaken in Northern Ireland with 29 loyalist and Republican paramilitaries in 2013, six claims to moral legitimacy were made. Some of these claims I will illustrate with quotations, but time uh, limits me uh, in uh, doing this. The, these uh, um, six claims to moral legitimacy are as follows. First, they were reluctant combatants. Secondly, the decision to take up arms and to continue with the military struggle was emotionally problematic and not taken lightly. Third moral claim, they were protecting their own community. Four, they have been heavily involved in subsequent conflict transformation. Five, the legacy of that decision leaves heavy, heavy suffering and costs to this day. And finally, sixth, 
people should be judged on what they do now for conflict transformation, not on the past. I'll illustrate uh, these, if I may. Regardless of how unsympathetically political opponents portray them, ex-combatants do not see themselves as psychopathic killers and mass murderers. They are aware, however, that this is often their public image. This implicates the need to stress that their military involvement was reluctant. It was reason, it was principle, it was not headstrong. Uh, their military engagement is also accounted for as an emotionally costly decision not taken lightly. Breed, uh, which is incidentally a pseudonym for one of the respondents, uh, showed remarkable honesty and indeed eloquence when describing the emotional legacy of her decision to join the ira and she is worth quoting at length quote the one thing that anybody will tell you who has been through a war is that they never want to see another one it's horrific you spend your time trying to find ways to kill people and half your time trying not to be killed. That's not the way you want for anyone, least of all the next generation. So, you know, war is horrible from start to finish. There's nothing good about it. End quote. When it was pointed out to her that she could have refused to engage militarily, she replied, quote, how could I have lived with me then? My community would have been left and it would have been genocidal, end quote. Now, these remarks <coughs> from both sets of paramilitaries comment on what they saw as their main motivation to, to fight, despite knowing the emotional costs. That motivation was to protect their communities. This gave their conduct higher moral meaning. But protection from what differed between Republicans and Loyalists? Connor, again a pseudonym, articulated a Republican view. Quote, we had no option in this. I'm not violent by nature. I was not brought up violent. I was made violent. See what I saw, you'd peelers, which is slang for police, you'd Brits, which is slang for the British Army, you'd loyalists attacking these areas. What do you do? End quote. Now, this language is redolent of decolonization. As David said, quote, I didn't go and invade England, they came into my country. End quote. Now, Pro-state loyalist paramilitaries, however, cannot use the language of decolonization. And this constrains the moral claims they're able to make. The loyalist response is to claim that they were defending their communities from Republican attacks. Their violence is still presented as reactive, provoked by others. Quote, I have no conscience through the conflict, Gary said. Quote, because I believed in my heart in what I was doing. I am not a troublemaker. It was only defense. Now, in making this claim about defense, loyalists were aware that their military involvement was Ill illegal in terms of the very state that they were defending. They had to confront, therefore, the realization that legal means existed to defend their communities through the state's own security forces. 
This forced upon loyalist ex-combatants the need to explain why they preferred instead to act outside of British law to defend British law. And loyalist interviewees stressed that their primary goal was to stop the IRA and to use methods that security forces were supposedly not allowed to. Some loyalists referred to the tacit support they got from the security forces who turned a blind eye. Uh, we would now call this collusion. Now, irrespective of the side on which they fought, all combatants shared the enduring legacy of their military involvement. Ex-combatants experienced an array of personal, financial, legal, health and social reintegration, reintegration problems. This legacy is made worse by the internecine turf war between loyalist organizations that continues, meaning that they now kill each other. It's made worse by dissident Republicans who regularly threaten supporters of Sinn Féin's peace strategy. Some ex-combatants, therefore, live under death threats. There is no easy escape from the legacy of the past, and the suggestion that they got off scot-free is quite erroneous. They are as much victims as are non-combatants, although victims in different ways. Although they bear the added burden, the added burden that not many perceive it, that many people perceive them as not suffering enough. Therefore, an important part of ex-combatants' moral claims to legitimacy is to claim that their reluctant but nonetheless honourable decision to defend their communities has brought costs that bystanders have been fortunate to evade. Now, another significant moral claim from both sets of, of ex-combatants is that their military involvement persuaded them to subsequently engage politically in the peace process. Loyalist ex-prisoners who underwent a religious conversion in prison distinguished their new born again life precisely by their later engagement with peace. And Republican ex-combatants in the sample also showed a similar personal transformation to peace militancy. Breed, uh, a, a, a committed atheist, and Mary, another pseudonym, a devout practicing Catholic, uh, said similar things. The Adams McGuinness strategy, as Breed described it, quote, was always pragmatic. The realization that the British Army can't beat us and we can't beat the British Army does throw up a moral dilemma because it would be immoral to continue with a struggle that you know you can't win and in which more people were going to die. That is such a powerful statement that I'd like to read it again. The realization that the British Army can't beat us and we can't beat the British Army does throw up a moral dilemma because it would be immoral to continue with a struggle that you know you can't win and in which more people were going to die. That speaks volumes about ex-combatants as moral agents. What matters, uh, uh, ex-combatants uh, ex argued, is what ex-combatants do now for peace not what circumstances once led them to do in war. Philip, pseudonym, 
a loyalist ex-prisoner, now heavily involved in local politics and community regeneration. Perhaps put this best when he said, quote, judge me for who I am now and where I'm going as opposed to what I was. Let me draw uh, this lecture to a conclusion. Northern Ireland's ex-combatants garner little public sympathy outside their own communities. The martyr hero demon syndrome means they are revered within their own community and despised without it. <clears throat> if However, if new generations are to understand why ordinary men and women who were moral agents went to war over half a century ago, it is necessary to transcend, move beyond the martyr hero demon syndrome. While past does not change, as the uh, 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 historian Christopher Hill once put it, the present does change. New questions need to be asked of the present. The new questions that need to be asked in the present about the war generation are many. But these new questions include the need to understand how the former combatants themselves make moral sense of their actions. How could I summarize that moral sense? As I hope I've shown, no matter how briefly, ex-combatants feel under an obligation to present themselves as moral agents. Their moral claims to legitimacy to legitimacy show them to be reluctant combatants and while they tempered this reluctance with a sense that military engagement was honorable in terms of protecting their community their decision to go to war was not taken lightly and it has in, and it has caused enduring victimization in some cases, emotional suffering and mental ill health. Now, their involvement in military activities was offset morally by active engagement now in conflict transformation. A better ethical standard, they felt, to judge them than by their past. So what can present generations learn from the moral claims made by people who went to war 50 years ago? I suggest their accounts evidence four things. First, their accounts show the situatedness of the structural conditions that made violence reasonable then. They tie their moral claims to the context in which they were recruit recruited into war. Violence is not, not always and universally reasonable. We were, the Republican David said, quote, a product of those days. And most ex-combatants therefore committed themselves to the peace process in the hope of changing the conditions that made violence in their eyes inevitable at that time. And all felt that the structural conditions which situated their violence then no longer exist now 
and they were fearful for a return to violence by younger generations and warned against this return to violence. Their involvement in military, in military struggle was situated to the conditions in which they were recruited into war. The second thing that I think new generations can learn from these men and women who went to war, that they went to war not as a first choice. It was a reluctant choice, a choice not lightly taken, a choice that has brought them victimization, harm and suffering. In most cases, however, it is a choice which they felt they had to make, given the structural conditions into which this choice is situated. The third thing which I think present generations can learn. Their accounts were concerned to deny that they had been dehumanized and brutalized by their military service, or that they had morally enervated their opponents, stripping them of human dignity. This is the mark of them remaining as moral agents, despite their engagement in the use of violence. Most Republicans and most loyalists were eager to claim that they did not enervate their enemy or dehumanize them. Although some thought that this is precisely what their enemy, what their enemy had done to them. Now the fourth feature of their accounts is the last point on which I wish to end. And it's a more appropriate conclusion. And it is that they all realized that in the end, violence did not work. Violence can be virtuous. Violence can be instrumental. Sometimes violence is necessary, but it always comes at a significant cost. Regardless of Ella Wheeler Wilcox's suggestion that violence is sinful, the people who fight wars in protest mostly end up thinking war is bad. Harry, a loyalist, made this point clearly. He could no longer support violence, even if the conflict, quote, kicked off again, because history shows that, quote, violence does not work. Never again, he said of his military service. Breed, a strident atheist, an ardent Republican woman, is worth quoting again. Quote, the one thing that anyone will tell you who has been through a war is they never want to see another one. It's horrific, end quote. Now, let that stand as the chief moral lesson ex-combatants can teach new generations about Northern Ireland's conflict. Thank you. And since I'm in Ireland, Guramaya Agaf. Thank you very much for that thought-provoking and engaging talk. I was going to respond back in, in Gaelic, um, but it's escaped me for the moment. I'm sure one of the um, delegates will be able to help me. Um, we have time now for a number of uh, questions, ob observations and comments. Um, I'd like to hand, it, hand the rest of the session over to the floor. Have we any have we any hands raised? It looks like Phil Nelson has a hand raised, so I will go ahead and give you the mic, Phil. Thank you very much for that presentation. It was really, really interesting. Um, I'm specifically interested in the choice between 
paramilitarism and joining state forces. Um, so orig originally, I suppose, the argument that um, paramilitaries can do things that state forces can't, it's based on a belief that state forces can't succeed without that, that added help. Um, but when it comes to individuals, they, there's an argument of others providing a public good and free riding. So why did these, these individuals that you spoke to decide that they needed to get involved in paramilitary organizations? Why did they decide that they were best placed or had a moral obligation to engage in paramilitarism rather than joining the state forces? That's my question. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Philip. Um, um, some of the ex -com loyalist ex-combatants we interviewed explained that they had tried to join the police. They failed either the height regulation, the health regulation, or the education uh, um, qualification. <clears throat> But most of the ex loyalist ex combatants we interviewed were from a background in which uh, they had been involved in youth antisocial behavior, youth criminal activities that would have debarred them from the police in the first place. But it also has to be said, you have to understand the social status that comes with being a member of the paramilitaries in loyalist communities. <clears throat> and there is, I think, a considerable degree of social capital involved in the decision to be in the uh, in uh, the paramilitaries within loyalist communities. And this social capital is an incentive to go into the paramilitaries rather than the the uh, 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 the, the police. Now it also has to be said that there were many that that um, uh, Northern Ireland Protestants constitute, uh, along with uh, uh, the Scots, uh, 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 constitute one of the most important recruiting grounds for the British Army. Thank you so much for your lecture. I really enjoyed it. I was hoping to hear your thoughts on moral communities, in quotes, and occupational culture. You mentioned that moral claims are used to make certain acts seem reasonable. So I'm wondering what your view is on how moral communities i.e. how a group of activists will look to like-minded people for influence as opposed to relying on an organization's standards. How do you think this impacts moral legitimacy in society in the case of Northern Ireland specifically? I hope this makes sense, she shares. Uh, thank you very much, Megan. Uh, uh, um, if I may say so, that's a wonderful question. Uh, I did not, in my talk tonight, reference the different claims to legitimacy that uh, ex uh, exist. But in the chapter from which this talk is based, I go into great length about uh, the, the, what I refer to as the governance model of legitimacy that's based, that bases legitimacy on the rule of law. Things are legitimate because they follow the rules of law, which inevitably means that, um, uh, non-state actors challenging the state are deemed to be illegitimate. It also means that state security forces are automatically deemed to be legitimate. 
as you can see, the, the governance model of legitimacy that bases it on the rule of law is highly problematic. The report from the coroner of the Ballymurphy massacre shows precisely that. And so we need to uh, um, expand the models which confer legitimacy. And I compared the governance model of legitimacy that bases itself on the rule of law, <coughs> I compared that <coughs> to what I referred to as the community model of legitimacy that bases itself on the ethical standards and practices of a local community. Now, <clears throat> and that gets near to your view of local cultures that confer certain acts as being legitimate, that the governance model based on the rule of law would not see as legitimate. And you can see in many ways that both loyalist ex-combatants and Republican ex-combatants drew on community models of legitimacy to give their actions a moral uh, character despite being contrary to the rule of law and the governance model of um, um, legitimacy. So you're quite right. We need to move beyond governance, the traditional governance model of legitimacy that bases it on the rule of law to look at local cultures and the way local cultures can legitimate practices, uh, beliefs that are contrary to the uh, rule of law. So Melanie shares, she says, I work with women ex-combatants in Colombia, a very different issue clearly, but I worked in the peace process in Belfast in 1995, which is where I first saw differences in how women combatants came and went from violent acts, also in how they function in society after they leave the war. Did you see differences in how men, women approached during the war and or leaving it or supporting the peace? Um, there are. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll make a few comments, and then I'm going to pass that to Azrini, who is the uh, uh, one of the best experts on women ex-combatants. But you're absolutely right. Um, there are fundamental differences between men and women that have that are uh, related to gender issues. And that there are also differences in the impact of gender in the three case countries we looked at. So, <clears throat> even in Northern Ireland, where, where women ex-combatants uh, engaged as much in a fight against inequality including gender inequality, as against colonialism, <clears throat> they often found a Republican movement that resisted the entry of women into the public sphere and resisted the a full claim to equality. But this was particularly pronounced in Sri Lanka and South Africa, <clears throat> which are um, um, colonial societies of women activists has been to almost silence their voice. Uh, indeed, in Sri Lanka's case, as um, both chapters on Sri Lanka in the book emphasize, there has been a strategy to return women to the domestic sphere. Uh, that militant women, as I said in my lecture, were perceived to have virtues that meant their participation in the struggle was forced or uh, 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 
made them culturally abnormal, and they were to um, reintegrate by returning back to the domestic role. <clears throat> so one of the most important problems faced by women ex-combatants in particular <clears throat> is that they have, uh, certainly in all three of our cases, failed to realize a truly uh, equal society in gender terms and therefore have to confront the continuance of patriarchal notions that <coughs> um, attribute uh, stereotypical qualities to women. And part of that process involves their silencing. Now, Republican uh, 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 women are perhaps <clears throat> um, uh, more uh, involved in the public sphere given that they're in the global north but in the South African and Sri Lankan cases e being in the global south where they confront even more patriarchal and traditional societies <clears throat> it is very very difficult for women to continue their role in the public sphere Azrini is there anything else that, that uh, you, you, you would want to add to that I mean, just to, just to add, in terms of the Northern Irish context, uh, we have to remember that female ex -com female combatants didn't get the the right to have a vote within the IRA until a lot later. Um, and what we can see, which is replicated in other societies, but to to varying degrees, is how women have been silenced. Um, how their experiences have been uh, neglected and unacknowledged in many cases for their um, activities. The next question comes from Francis who asks, Hi John, would you say that Republicans went to war out of ideology in that their political channels of expression were blocked and loyalists went to war out of a pseudo-religious conviction that was fostered by big house unionism? In other words, do you feel that both sides went to war for different reasons due to different social forces? Uh, I, I certainly agree with the conclusion to that question. <clears throat> that is to say, the motivations to go to war were quite different from Republicans compared to loyalists. How I would characterize the social structural conditions that encouraged <coughs> participation in war, uh, <coughs> I would uh, perhaps not quite fully agree with the um, um, the characterization in the question. <clears throat> but the, the, the main thrust of the question, that the, con that the, con that the conditions for, for war were social structural, <clears throat> uh, I, I f fully agree with. Um, this question comes from Sandra, who asks, to what extent does your text in McGee's chapter take on women's roles in loyalist paramilitaries? Um, it's worth saying that uh, most of the literature on women's engagement in military struggle in, in Northern Ireland has been on Republican women. <coughs> um, um, loyalist women did participate in in uh, some military activities. There was a loyalist section <coughs> in prison. There are loyalist women ex-prisoners. <coughs> um, uh, uh, but the attention is mostly on Republicans, and that's because of the critical mass of Republican women who participated in, in the struggle. <clears throat> I do think that, however, that you're absolutely right to try to isolate the role of women within loyalism. 
and not just in that gendered stereotypical way as providing support and nurturing their militant men <clears throat> you know, we need to move beyond that characterization we need to look at women as active participates participants in the public loyalist women as active participants in the public sphere but that has yet to be um, uh, done, and uh, <coughs> uh, 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 you know, I think Dave McGee's Dave McGee's chapter in that book, I think, is actually pioneering. Indeed, his PhD, uh, on which the chapter is based, was pioneering because he <coughs> he, he tries to go beyond that hyper masculinity. Uh, militant masculinity perspective <clears throat> that sees loyalists as simply pumped up on steroids, you know, doing hyper masculinity. He tries to go beyond that to look at some of the emotional dynamics of people, of, of loyalist men who went <clears throat> in, um, uh, 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 to war. And so I think that there are key issues within the uh, um, loyalist uh, ex-combatants that need to be, uh, I think, brought to the centre stage. And it's not just the role of loyalist women. It's the, it's you know <clears throat> deconstructing uh, uh, hyper masculinity identities uh, and moving beyond that that um, <clears throat> a, a, a stereotype of muscle bound. Uh, steroid filled uh, loyalist men <clears throat> because it's much more complex than that. I was just moving on to Jan uh, to Jay. Um, so thank you so much. This is really interesting. I um, I haven't read the whole book. Um, I've only um, read and, and haven't properly read the two chapters on Sri Lanka. Um, so perhaps this question is answered in the book, um, in which case please direct me to it. Um, but I just wanted to pick up on what Azrini was saying, what Azrini and John were saying about the silencing of women's voices in the aftermath of war. Um, and um, what I wondered was that um, at the same time as, of course, the evidence in Sri Lanka fully bears out the, the uh, deliberate approach of the Sri Lankan state to silence those voices. There have been voices raised and, um, for example, through the um, families of the disappeared, through ex-combatants organising to the extent they can, through civil society organisations, and, and I know that uh, um, both Bhavani and I'm really sorry, I, the other author of the chapter, whose name I just can't remember off the top of my head, will we'll, we'll know about this. They didn't come up in the, I didn't see those come up in the chapters, and I wondered why that was. And linked to that, um, given this conversation about silencing and about people articulating their own voices and the media representations, I wondered about the, the Tamil media representations or the Tamil language media representations, which I didn't see in that chapter on media representations. And I was particularly interested in um, in Bhavani's chapter, she, she um, quotes uh, Thamalini's uh, book, and that I thought there was a very interesting kind of um, arc of Thamalini's thinking, which is in media, albeit YouTube, rather than a book from kind of, I don't know, 20 years ago through to her book, which is now available in English translation by Nedra Rodrigo. Um, but of course, it was available in Tamil translation, and I wondered why those didn't feature. Uh, was it just a case of resources or was it, you know, was there a specific reason why? Thank you. And sorry for the rambling question. It really has to be said that the, the, almost the return of the Rajapaska regime, the return of that repression, uh, has encouraged a return to fear. I was only talking to two Sri Lankan colleagues last night on <coughs> through modern technology. And in fact, I've been su surprised about the extent to which there is a return to a climate of fear. 
And I think that there's, uh, we ought not to, while there are critical female voices, uh, and particularly critical human rights voices within the Tamil regions, we ought not to exaggerate the extent of those. <clears throat> Uh, and we need to recognize the huge constraints operating. Uh, I have visited Sri Lanka five times. I have uh, been in the, uh, the north in Jaffna. And uh, the, the, sp the space, the space for uh, uh, women's voice particularly women's Tamil voice is highly constrained and I think that there are chapters on uh, Sri Lanka <coughs> uh, re reflected that incidentally uh, I, I, I would add we had tried very uh, um, um, uh, vociferously to get a chapter on state veterans within the Sinhalese dominated army. But the constraints I've been talking about, <clears throat> this return to Rajapaskan style uh, repression, this return of fear uh, meant that the authors were not prepared to do it. <clears throat> so I think that, um, I think that um, uh, uh, we have to acknowledge the constraints on Tamil ex-combatant women as part of the repression of uh, uh, the, the, the Tamil population. Um, <clears throat> in earlier research, I've described Tamils as experiencing a double victimhood. Not only do they have uh, the emotional, uh, perhaps a uh, uh, physical uh, uh, legacy of the violence. They are, they suffer being vanquished as a group, subject to cultural annihilation, in which they're not allowed to memorialize, in which Tamil names are, are being replaced by Sinhalese names, in which uh, Hindu and Buddhist religious <coughs> symbols are appearing in uh, Tamil society. <coughs> um, uh, you know, this cultural annihilation, as I call it, uh, constrains the, the capacity of Tamil ex-combatant women. Thank you for that, John. Um, we're going to move over to Deirdre McBride. Thanks. John, thank you for a very stimulating lecture. And my question really is, of the four points that you were making at the end, and particularly around that violence doesn't pay and the people argue that they did not become dehumanised or dehumanise the enemy, do you see evidence of examples or of in this society of where people are able to hear that or to take it on board thank you uh, thank you very much Deirdre <clears throat> uh, I can actually see you now H hello Deirdre hi um, I have to say Deirdre that, that, that there are very few uh, uh, social spaces in Northern Ireland where we can hear the voices of ex-combatants Republican or loyalist um, you know this 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 martyr hero demon syndrome is i think probably more acute in northern ireland than in the other two societies we looked at in the book and i think this uh, martyr uh, hero demon syndrome prevents us hearing properly the voices of ex-combatants and, <clears throat> and indeed in the first few pages of the book 
we felt the need almost to apologize <clears throat> for writing a book that captured um, ex-combatant voices because we anticipated that the hostility that's uh, b b um, implicit <clears throat> in the hero the the the, the, the martyr uh, hero demon syndrome the hostility within that would be uh, <clears throat> transferred to academics but we strongly feel that the voices of ex-combatants do need to be heard because they are making a transition from war to peace <clears throat> And they have a valuable contribution to make. And I think that part of the problem of Northern Ireland's peace process is that we are deaf to certain sorts of things that we do not want to hear. And I think that Northern, most people in Northern Ireland do not want to hear that ex-combatants were moral agents who limited and constrained their military activity because they were moral agents. They just want to demonize them or hero worship them. We need to create, in other words, more spaces in which ex-combatants' voices can be heard. We have one final question from Francis who asks, John, do you have a theory why loyalist paramilitaries have not really gone away and are still recruiting and involved in criminality? Paradoxically, Republican paramilitaries have more or less stood down. Uh, thank you very much, Francis. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> it's worth pointing out that uh, dissident Republicans have not disappeared from the stage. Although, um, of course, dissident Republicanism um, uh, is um, quite minor. You're absolutely right. Why has why have the loyalist paramilitaries not disappeared from the stage? Now, part of that is, I think, because some not all, but a minority of loyalist paramilitaries disguise their organized criminality by wrapping themselves in the flag of loyalism. <clears throat> but there are also other social structural reasons why loyalist paramilitaries survive and continue, not just because <clears throat> they are a disguise for criminality. L loyalist paramilitaries offer some sociological advantages. <clears throat> they confer social status. They resolve issues around the crisis of masculinity. They, they provide employment opportunities. And it has to be said that they exploit, they exploit uh, <clears throat> the class inequalities that working class loyalist communities experience. Now, I've written on this in the past. I think the problems of loyalism are class based, but they are disguised through a culture war. The obsession with flags, the obsession with marching, the obsession with identity, the obsession with fighting a culture war actually obscures the fundamental social structural class inequalities of working class loyalists their severe educational disadvantage, their high levels <clears throat> of poverty and social deprivation. <clears throat> Loyalists ought to be fighting a class war, but instead they're persuaded to fight a culture war. <clears throat> and in as much as they fight a culture war rather than a class war, 
the loyalist paramilitaries have uh, <coughs> reasons to persist. Apologies for the technological glitches. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity once again to thank John for such an inspirational talk that has left us with more questions uh, about how we reconceptualize the identity of ex combat or former combatants. John is quite right that new questions have to be asked of the present and therefore new spaces can be created in understanding ex-combatants' voices transitioning from war to peace in Northern Ireland, South Africa, Sri Lanka, and also other places. We, um, in, in the move to transitioning from war to peace, what it Im embeds in, in the, within the framework is a hope, a hope for change, a hope for a better future. And it's on that note, that I would like to thank not only John, Maeve, but also the uh, participants who joined us from all over the globe. I noticed we had people from South Africa, Sri Lanka, um, the States, so Canada, um, Detroit. So thank you very much um, for your attendance. Thank you, John. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, and um, uh, best wishes to you all.